Uh, well, and lucky you all who are back in the room in time for what's next, because this is the place on the agenda where we recognize a lifetime achievement honoree. Now, this is an elite and distinguished cohort of women. Past C3E Lifetime Achievement Award winners have been uh, MIT Professor Emerita Millie Dresselhouse. Our second year, we, we honor the Vice President, um, a Vice President of the National Academy of Engineering, Maxine Savitz. And last year, we honored Sue Tierney of the Analysis Group here in Boston. Now, honorees are women who are remarkable both for their contributions to the clean energy field, but also for their dedication to supporting and advancing women. Here to introduce this year's honorees are two of our ambassadors who've had the chance to work directly with our honoree out in their home state of California, and who are two formidable anchors of C3E out on the West Coast. Diane Grunick of Stanford and Nancy Fund of DBL Investors, please come on up and take it away. Thank you. We're going to tag team it that I'm Diane Grunick and I'll start off and then Nancy. So we are absolutely delighted. Let me start off by asking who here has heard of Mary Nichols? <laughs> Good. Um, our shorthand for Mary is the queen of green and clean. Um, sometimes we think that she is literally not just running everything we care about in California for clean energy and climate, but also doing it single-handedly around the world. So there is truly nobody we can think of better to honor. Um, I looked back and I've known Mary and worked with her for 30 years, since 1985. And um, especially for the younger women in this crowd, um, get a mentor. I can say that Mary has been my mentor for basically my entire professional life, and it's been a privilege every step of the way. Just a few things on her background. Um, she got her BA from Cornell and her JD from Yale, um, but we in California were very honored that she did not stay on the East Coast but came to California. She has held remarkable positions at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, she worked with the Los Angeles Mayor's Office, Tom Bradley, at the state. She is currently the head of our Air Resources Board, which is making major commitments on climate change. And she also was head of our, um, she served as Secretary for Natural Resources. At the federal level, she worked for the US EPA as head of their Office of Air and Regulation. I found two interesting facts about Mary, that she brought the very first litigation successfully under the Federal Clean Air Act, which is one of our most important pieces of law we have. Um, she also founded the Natural Resources Defense Council's Los Angeles office. So this is a woman who has given tremendous service, not just within government, as I said, at every level, but also in the private sector. And just quickly, um, in terms of California, she has just really shaped a vision. And what she's known for is an ability to bring together diverse parties and work through at great level, but with great vision where we can go. So Nancy's gonna fill in some of the real vision with um, Mary, but it's just a tremendous honor to be able to honor Mary. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Well, it's a thrill to be here again, and congratulations to the entire C3E team for pulling off yet another outstanding conference. So getting back to Mary Nichols, um, I just want to say a couple of words, one on a personal level and one at a societal level about, um, about Mary. Um, Mary Nichols, to me, is a personal hero of mine. And even though she's in the public sector and I'm a venture capitalist, uh, she, watching her uh, pursue climate policies that are innovative and that are working, uh, particularly uh, greenhouse gas cap and trade related um, 
and seeing just how calm and authoritative she is every time she gets sued, which for a while there, it seemed like every day. <laughs> <laughs> and because in, in my world, you know, we have our, our troubles and, you know, every successful company has had many d near death experiences along the way, but you try not, you try to kind of cover those up and, and, and can get very stressful and, and you think that everything, you're going to lose everything. Um, and yet looking at Mary, who had huge, high stakes policy that she was pushing through with, with the governors that she's worked for, uh, just remain cool, collected and calm and, and, uh, but still not, not accepting anything less than uh, implementing the vision that, that we all know so well today. So I, every time I get rattled, I think of Mary, <laughs> Mary Nichols and say, oh, no problem. Uh, and then on a societal level, um, you know, a lot of people often say that regulation impedes innovation. Um, and Mary ha has been able to show just the opposite by, sh by developing regulations that actually catalyze innovation. And one that I've worked with <clears throat> in the early days of Tesla is something called ZEV. That's the Zero Emission Vehicle Credit. And this was basically something that CARB came up with and Mary implemented that said to car manufacturers in California, look, you either sell a certain percentage of zero emission vehicles or you, you pay to get a credit for, uh, from someone that does. And so lo and behold, that policy, and I don't even know if they anticipated this because <laughs> Tesla was kind of an unknown at that time, but all of a sudden Tesla was spending a lot of money getting that loan that we talked about earlier, <laughs> trying to get not just, not the Model S even, the, the sports car, the Roadster out, and um, we were using a lot of cash. We didn't have revenues from cars yet, except deposits. And so it was a pretty dicey time. And yet we were able to have a revenue line in those very early years of car companies paying to get our credits because we were uh, going to be manufacturing and, and selling cars. And so the, the ZEV credits were to Tesla building blocks and, and allowed us to to, um, get some cash in the door when we weren't at full production and we, we didn't have you know, our main revenue line, which we all know about today. And so that's such smart regulation. It's, it's, it's smart in terms of achieving climate goals, but also realizing that it's the private sector and it's entrepreneurship and it's innovation that are the key to scaling solutions to climate change. So we, we just owe Mary so much and we're, we're, we're sorry she can't be here today, but she's no doubt solving another climate <laughs> problem uh, after lunch. And we do have Mary here by video, uh, and we're, we're gonna show that to you now. So let's give a round for Mary Nichols. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be able to join you, even if it's only by video, to accept your uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, I am thrilled to be getting an award, although it does mean that I've lived a lifetime, but I guess I can accept that. I'm really joining a terrific group of women here as recipients of this award, including Mildred Dresselhaus and Maxine Savitz and my friend Sue Tierney. And speaking of Sue Tierney reminds me that I first met Sue when both of us were serving in the Clinton administration. And uh, it's especially meaningful to me at this point that I'm receiving a, an award from a group that's affiliated with the Department of Energy because at my time in Washington, I was working for US EPA as the Assistant Administrator for Air and Radiation. And it was my job to implement the then brand new Clean Air Act amendments of uh, 1990 and to uh, spend a lot of my time fighting with people at the Department of Energy over why it was that they had to comply with some of the requirements that they regarded as particularly onerous and interfering. Uh, one of my greatest triumphs during my time at EPA was developing the joint logo for the um, Energy Star Plan, which if you look very, very closely, has in tiny little letters at the bottom of the Energy Star logo, 
EPA and DOE. And the negotiations that led to the ability of these two agencies to agree on how to implement the program, I feel are probably worthy of this award uh, in and of themselves. But I also want to say, because this is an organization that's devoted to uh, empowering and educated, educating women about energy, that when I first started doing this work, um, there weren't very many of us in any part of the energy world. Indeed, when I was appointed to the Air Resources Board, I was the only woman, and I occupied that uh, seat for quite some time. Uh, but after I'd been there for a while, it suddenly uh, became obvious that there were people working for the auto companies and for the utilities and the oil companies who were female and that they could find them and uh, put them into positions where they could come in and talk to the ARB. So uh, while we still have a long way to go in terms of achieving full parity, uh, especially at the very top of the executive suites, um, there is progress that has happened. And the presence of so many prominent women uh, in the room where you all are and receiving your awards is a very good indication of that. So um, I want to wish you the best with the rest of your program and once again express my great pleasure at being allowed to be included on your roster of award recipients. Thank you very much. Is, is Ms. Grid Alternatives out there? <laughs> You, uh, did you notice that the plaque behind her said grid alternatives? I thought Erica might have, <laughs> we'll have to let her <laughs> worked know. on that. Anyway, that's our Mary. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>